And there are two other people up for Best Cinematographer Award. That's Darius Konji and Florian Hofmeister. Good luck to all of them. We will, of course, be live from the red carpet and we will have a special programme on the Oscars at 0930 GMT on Monday. Do join us for that. Uh, just a recap of some breaking news on a big story here in the UK. The high-speed rail line HS2. The BBC understands that certain sections of the HS2 line are going to be delayed to save money. The government is about to announce that, we understand. It's thought it will primarily affect sections from Manchester to Crewe and Birmingham to Crewe. But sources have also indicated that some of the design teams working on the Euston end of the line in London may be affected. You're watching BBC News. I'm at Anita BBC. This is BBC News. Welcome, whether you're watching in the UK or around the globe. I'm Sean Lay. Our top stories this hour. Russia has launched more than 80 missiles at Ukraine. Sustained strikes hit the Kharkiv and Odessa regions, killing at least nine people and leaving much of the capital, Kyiv, without electricity on Thursday. It is very scary because every time uh, they are hitting not only the uh, infrastructure, but they're hitting civilians. People are dying. The UK government is set to announce the construction of certain sections of its new high-speed railway HS2 is to be delayed to save money. Protesters in Israel prepare for another day of mass demonstration against proposed reforms to the judicial system. Child care costs rise sharply in England, Scotland and Wales. New report shows nursery fees are almost £15,000 for the youngest children. Weather warnings for heavy snow in parts of the UK. The cold conditions are expected to last at least until the weekend. This is Rowan Bridge in Mould in North Wales, where an amber weather warning for significant ice and snow could bring disruption through today. Hello, and if you've just joined us, welcome to BBC News. Ukraine says Russia has fired at least 80 missiles at targets across the country, part of an overnight bombardment, the most significant wave of attacks since the anniversary of the invasion was marched two weeks ago. The targets were across Ukraine, from Kharkiv in the north to Odessa in the south. At least three people are reported dead in Hershon region. President Zelensky, in a statement published on the social media feed Telegram, said 10 regions in all have been hit. He added that Russia would not avoid responsibility. This is drone footage of the Solochiv district of Lviv in western Ukraine. Five people have been killed there. More are believed to have died under and be buried under the rubble. As well as residential buildings and critical infrastructure, the strikes have left the Zaporizhia nuclear power station without electricity. Well, Francis Reed has more. James Landell there, that report um, just filed in the last few minutes. And let me bring you um, a bit of breaking news, uh, which is coming from a Russian news agency, RIA. It's quoting the Defence Minister describing today's attacks on infrastructure as a retaliation for what he described as the Bryansk region terrorist attacks. Now, you may remember that in incident a few days ago where uh, a far-right militia group which is anti-Russia. Uh, I mean, there are various groups, many of which have their roots in the Second World War. The partisans who fought against uh, the Russians on the Eastern Front, those who were fighting against the Nazis as well. Um, and some of those historical re tensions remain in the modern politics of Ukraine to this very day. I've actually seen uh, a militia group, far-right militia group, actually having their weapons blessed in a religious ceremony in a forest in western Ukraine some years ago. Um, so these things have a long history. Nobody knows who this group are, their history of the group, but they claimed and had footage of entering um, a, a Russian town 
in the Bryansk region, Russian held town in the Bryansk region. Well, the Defence Ministry is saying, according to REA, that today's uh, attacks are retaliation for what they claim was a Ukrainian uh, organised uh, attack on um, on that town of Bryansk. Right, uh, the UN Nuclear Agency's chief has warned of the danger of repeated power outages at Zaporizhia after a fresh missile strike left it running, as James said there, on diesel generators. Let's talk now to Michael Fitzpatrick, Pro Vice Chancellor at Coventry University, who's talked to us before about the state of the nuclear programme in uh, in Ukraine. Professor, thank you very much for being with us today. This isn't, as James was saying, the first time the Zaporizhia has, has effectively gone offline. Can it just keep going like this? Can it carry on? getting online, getting offline, or are there any kind of potential problems that arise simply for that, that flipping in and out? Professor Michael Fitzpatrick at Coventry University. As ever, thanks very much for talking to us on yeah. BBC News. Now here, the government is set to announce that construction of certain sections of Britain's long-promised new high-speed rail line, HS2, are to be postponed to save money. The delay is likely to affect sections of the line from Manchester to Crewe and Birmingham to Crewe. The project has run billions of pounds over budget and is years and years behind its original schedule. But it remains the government's flagship transport levelling up project and the largest infrastructure project in Europe. Um, let's turn out to our transport correspondent, Katie Austin. Katie, um, it's a long saga and we haven't got all day, but I in essence, what are the con what's the continuing problem with HS2, which mind means that none of us are surprised when there's yet another delay announced? I know you'll be back if we get any more on this, but it's the, the key breaking story of the morning. So thank you very much for giving it to us here on BBC News. That's an exclusive to the BBC. Now, Georgia's ruling party has dropped plans to introduce a controversial law which had prompted more than two days of protest in the capital, Tbilisi. This was the scene on Wednesday evening where demonstrators turned out for a second successive night. You see the tear gas being used and projectiles being thrown at the police. Well, tens of thousands uh, and uh, that, that uh, bill has now been abandoned, although the government says it believes the principle of identifying foreign agents, as it calls them, is an important one to another country facing significant protests and not for the first time. Tens of thousands of Israelis have begun rallies across the country in protest against the coalition government's proposed radical overhaul of the judicial system. Demonstrators plan to disrupt transport and block major roads in Tel Aviv. The protests could make it difficult for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to leave on an official visit. In a separate development, three Palestinians have been shot dead by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank. Israel says the man, the men opened fire before being shot by undercover officers. The militant Palestinian group Islamic Jihad says the deaths were an assassination. All this comes as the US Secretary of State Lloyd Austin arrives in Israel 24 hours later than he originally planned and having decided not to meet in the Defence Ministry but potentially on the edge of uh, the city at Ben Gurion Airport. Um, let's talk now to uh, an academic and uh, specialist, Amichai Cohen. Amichai is a senior fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute. Mr Cohen, thank you very much for being with us on BBC News. Um, let me ask you, first of all, about these protests. They have been going on now for some weeks. Uh, the views, if anything, have become more polarised, not less, in the discussion that has gone on. What do you think is the fundamental point about these judicial reforms? Why do they matter so much, whether you're in favour of them or against them? Amy Cohen, uh, we'll see how that develops in the course of the next few days and whether or not um, the Prime Minister can actually get to the airport to meet uh, the US Defence Secretary. Uh, Amy Cha Cohen, who's Senior Fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Now, in the UK, a charity has warned that the price of childcare is rising sharply and the number of places available is dropping. Quorum says British parents are now having to pay so much to have their young children looked after that some are unable to work and the system needs urgent reform. The government says it has spent £20 billion in the past five years to help families with childcare costs. Uh, the UK is one of the most expensive countries in the world, though, for childcare. The average cost of a full-time nursery place for a child under the age of two currently stands at just under £16,000 a year. That puts the UK in the top three most expensive countries in the world, according to the OECD. The only countries where parents need to spend a higher percentage of their income on childcare are Switzerland and New Zealand. 
Around the world, costs vary quite dramatically with childcare, costing much less in Austria, Hungary and Portugal than it does in some Western European countries. And we'll leave that graphic up just for a couple of minutes so you can see it long enough to get an idea of what it's saying. You can see the childcare costs. Um, this is two years ago, the most recent figures available, but that's quite a spread between New Zealand, where it's the most expensive, uh, and Austria, and the UK is third most expensive, as we were saying. Now, let's talk to Kirsty Lester, who's Managing Director of Sunbeams Daycare in Dorset. Um, Kirsty, thank you very much for being with us. How many Sunbeams have you got at the moment? Yeah, um, we'll Hello. I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. Kirsty Lester, for now, Director of Sunbeams Daycare in Dorset. Thank you very much. That's the story we're going to be talking about more during the course of the rest of the day here on BBC News. I'm Sean Lay, back shortly. Hello there. North-South divide across Europe the last couple of days. Cold with some disruption. The invasion that shook the world. I just can't imagine living in the war without Ukraine. I can't imagine that. And the fight back that took everyone by surprise. The big question now, how much longer will the West continue to support Ukraine's defence? The war in Ukraine one now year on. BBC on. World the News, the latest business news from across the globe. IPlayer. World Business Report. Chipping away at China, the Netherlands joins the US in its crackdown on exports of advanced semiconductor technology. And we'll have a closer look at the European battle with the US to attract new business as Volkswagen is lured west with subsidies. Hello, welcome along. This is World Business Report. I'm Ben Thompson. Now, the battle is hotting up for supplies of computer chips. Last year, a shortage of them led to supply chain disruption around the world. It uh, meant that there were delays to everything from cars to washing machines and, of course, computers. Well, now the Dutch government has announced that it will impose new export restrictions on advanced chips being sold to China. The Dutch have some of the most significant companies in the field and China is keen to buy them. But the US has been putting pressure on European countries to curb their exports of sensitive technology to China on national security grounds. Our correspondent Anna Holligan is in The Hague. So Anna Holligan there in The Hague, underlining the political aspect to so many business stories right now, a bit of protectionism going on uh, in certain countries around the world. And that also been underlined this week too, when the car maker Volkswagen announced it would reprioritize its battery production to North America because it's chasing new US subsidies that are being offered there. It could mean that a plant that was planned for Eastern Europe could shift to America instead. Well, the EU has not yet set out its plans or incentives to attract new technology, particularly green tech. So what exactly is involved in building an industrial strategy to entice big companies to invest and create thriving business environments overall? Let's hear from the trade policy expert, David Hennig, who's UK Director of European Centre for International Political Economy. David, thank you for being with us. And talk to me about how these strategies are determined, because we've quite clearly seen in the case of Volkswagen but there's an element to it of that chip shortage too of countries saying hang on we want to protect our national interests we want to protect our technology and also we want those jobs to come to our country yeah David it's really interesting isn't it uh, and one we'll hear a lot more about I'm sure for now though thank you David Hennig there UK director of the European Center for International Political Economy well let's head to the US now and the head of America's central bank the Federal Reserve facing more questions from Congress about the impact of rising interest rates Jerome Powell rattled financial markets on Tuesday when he suggested that borrowing costs may rise more than expected to keep a lid on prices there's also more pressure on the Fed on Wednesday in the form of strong labor market data uh, so Hussein has those details. The government has put crypto transactions under the spotlight in the form of the country's Money Laundering Act. The decision is being seen as a new step taken by authorities to tighten their supervision of digital assets. But what difference could it make? Is You're up to date. We'll see you very soon. Bye bye. A 
and you're watching BBC News. I'm Sean Lay. Welcome back. MPs have condemned the BBC's highest paid presenter, Gary Lineker, who criticised the government's new asylum policy on Tuesday. On social media, the sports presenter posted a message to his 8.7 million Twitter followers comparing the new plans for people arriving in the UK by small boats to 1930s Germany, or perhaps to be more precise, from comparing the rhetoric that was being used by the government with the rhetoric used by the Nazis. So potentially quite an explosive uh, allegation that he was making and one that caused quite a bit of political backlash. He says that his job, uh, the BBC says it's having frank conversations with him about the BBC's commitment to impartiality. A short time ago, Gary Linker said he stands by his posts and that he and the BBC's Director General chat often. Now, forecasters are warning of heavy snow and travel disruption this morning, in particular uh, to parts of central and northern England. The Met Office has issued an amber warning for Thursday morning across the Peak District, Leeds, the Yorkshire Dales and the North Pennines. Many of those regions are expecting 10 to 20 centimetres of snow. The UK recorded its coldest March since 2010 last night as temperatures plummeted to minus 16 degrees in the North Highlands. My correspondent Roman Bridge is in Mould in North Wales, from where he sent us this update. Rome Bridge reporting from Mould. Three people have been arrested by police investigating the fatal shooting of Ellie Edwards on Christmas Eve. Ellie, who was 26, was shot in the head while celebrating with friends at a pub in Wallasey. A 20-year-old man has been charged with possession of a prohibited weapon and assisting an offender. A second man and a woman were arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. A man's been arrested over footage shot from inside a police cordon on the day the body of Nicola Bully was found in a river in Lancashire. Miss Bully disappeared whilst walking her dog and her body was found three weeks later. Police say the man, 34, was detained on suspicion of malicious communication and offences and perverting the course of justice. He has been released on conditional bail. The number of people waiting to start routine hospital treatment in England has risen. According to NHS England, an estimated 7.21 million people were waiting to start treatment at the end of January. That's up from 7.20 million in December. It's the joint highest number since records began in August 2007. Almost half of children who become homeless have been forced to move schools with a third missing more than a month of teaching. It's according to a new report by the housing charity Shelter. It blames what it described as total inaction for the government for the number of young people in traumatic living arrangements. The government says it increased local housing allowance significantly during the pandemic and is delivering more affordable homes. Our social affairs correspondent Michael Buchanan reports. Now, for women in labour, gas and air is often a crucial form of relief. But some hospitals in England stopped offering it over safety concerns for medical staff using the equipment. It means some mothers have had to rely only on paracetamol while giving birth. BBC reporter Lee Milner was one of them, and she told Thomas McGill about her experience. Now, you may not know the name, but you will certainly recognise the face. Jim Moyer is otherwise known as one half of Reeves and Mortimer, but he's also a dab hand with a paintbrush. His latest collection has been inspired by his love of birds and is now on display at an exhibition centre in Newcastle. Sharuna Sagar has been to meet him. You're going gone but not forgotten, and what a way of reinventing yourself. Um, Jim Moyer's expedition, Moyer's expedition um, exhibition continues in Newcastle. Now, the artist Sam Cox, otherwise known as Mr Doodle, has spent three years covering all of his house in Kent with Doodles. You may remember we went and visited him before, but now he's gone even bigger with his artwork by doodling a multi-storey car park in Ashford. He is an extraordinary artist, isn't he? He's so meticulous. Time now for a look at another artist, Carol at the Weather. Hello again. Some of us have had some heavy snow through the morning and there's more heavy snow to come as well as ice. Remember it's going to be windy as well but the winds will ease through the day. Many of us having a dry day with some sunshine, but some winter showers in the north and some rain starting to come in across the southwest. But across the board it will feel cold. You're watching BBC News. I'm Sean Lay. Welcome, whether you're watching here in the UK or elsewhere around the world. Our top stories this hour. 
Russia launches more than 80 missile attacks on Ukraine. Sustained airstrikes hit the Kharkiv and Odessa regions. At least nine people have died. Much of the capital, Kyiv, is without electricity. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog has warned that this cannot go on after the overnight strikes by Russia left the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant again without power. We must commit to protect the safety and security of the plant and we need to commit now. The British government is set to announce the construction of certain sections of its new high-speed railway HS2 are to be delayed to save money. Tens of thousands of people are taking part in demonstrations in Israel against proposed reforms to the judicial system. And childcare costs rise sharply in England, Scotland and Wales. A new report shows nursery fees are almost £15,000 for the youngest child. Weather warnings for heavy snow in the UK. The cold conditions are expected to last at least until the weekend. This is Rowan Bridge in Mould in North Wales, where an amber weather warning for significant ice and snow could bring disruption through today. Welcome to BBC News. Ukraine says Russia has fired at least 80 missiles at targets across the country, part of an overnight bombardment. The most significant wave of attacks since the anniversary of the invasion was marked two weeks ago. Targets were across Ukraine from Kharkiv in the north to Odessa in the south. At least three people are reported dead in Hershon region. President Zelensky, speaking in a statement transmitted over the Telegram social media platform, said 10 regions in all have been hit. President Zelensky added that Russia would not avoid responsibility for its actions. These pictures from this morning are of the Zolochev district of Lviv in western Ukraine. Five people were killed there, more are feared dead but yet to be retrieved because their bodies are under the rubble. As well as residential buildings and critical infrastructure sites, the strikes have left the Zaporizhia nuclear power station without electricity. Well, the head of the UN's nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, said it was the sixth time that the plant, the largest nuclear facility in Europe, had lost all off-site power since Russia's invasion began a year ago. He warned that such an unsafe situation could not be allowed to continue. James Landale. The UK government is set to announce the, the construction of certain sections of Britain's new high-speed rail line, known as HS2, will be postponed to save money. The delay is expected to affect sections between Manchester and Crewe and Birmingham and Crewe. The project has run billions of pounds over budget and is years behind schedule. HS2 is the UK government's flagship transport levelling up project and the largest infrastructure project in Europe. Our transport correspondent Katie Austin has more. Katie Austin, our transport correspondent there. Now to Israel, where tens of thousands of people are rallying across the country in a further day of protest against the government's proposed radical overhaul of the judicial system. Some Israelis believe the changes could threaten democracy itself. Let's uh, dip into the pictures now in uh, Tel Aviv. This is a rally taking place in the city centre at the moment. There is also a significant police presence um, at the airport at uh, Tel Aviv airport. Um, protesters are trying to block the road there and the reason for that is the US Defence Secretary Lloyd uh, Austin is due to land at Tel Aviv and meet the Prime Minister Bini Netanyahu. They were going to meet in the Defence Ministry which is in the heart of Tel Aviv but because of these protests they were obviously worried that they couldn't ensure uh, the safety of such a high profile international figure. Uh, he has nothing to do with the, the controversy but because he was coming there and uh, so they moved it to the airport which is a secure location. Now, uh, the BBC's highest paid presenter, Gary Lineker, says he stands by his criticism of the government's immigration policy and doesn't fear being suspended by the corporation. On Tuesday, Mr Lineker used social media to post a message to his 8.7 million followers on Twitter in which he compared some of the rhetoric being used by the government to defend its new plan uh, to crack down on people trying to get into Britain through uh, arriving on small boats to some of the rhetoric used by the Nazis in Germany in the 1930s. That was Lucy Fraser and you also heard uh, Gregory Campbell, Democratic Unionist MP there. A charity in the UK has warned that the price of childcare is rising sharply and the number of places available is dropping. 
Coram says British parents are now in to pay so much to have their young children looked after that some are unable to work and the system needs urgent reform. Ministers say it has spent, they've spent £20 billion in the past five years to help families with childcare costs. Well, the UK is certainly one of the most expensive countries to get childcare in. The average cost of a full-time nursery place for a child under two in Great Britain stands at just 15, just under £15,000. That puts the UK in the top three most expensive countries in the world. Uh, you can see that uh, childcare costs in countries like Austria and Portugal and Hungary are significantly lower than in countries like the UK, Switzerland and New Zealand. In fact, those last two are the only countries, uh, apart from Britain, where uh, childcare costs are so high. Of course, the costs do vary. Childcare costs much less in some countries than in others. Well, our correspondent Hannah Milner has been speaking to parents struggling with the cost of childcare. Very interesting point to end on. It's a kind of bigger philosophical point, isn't it? But it's actually quite an important one. Amiga, thank you very much for talking to us and congratulations you. on your good news about the forthcoming thank you. baby. Now, it's been revealed that the former Shell boss, Ben Van Buren, received a pay package of £9.7 million last year, an increase of more than 50% from 2021, where he was paid the equivalent of £6.3 million in euros. Shell reported its highest annual profits in its 115 year history last year making a record 32.2 billion pound profit that's following a surge in energy prices following russia's invasion of ukraine british opposition parties say the government has let the energy firms off the hook on taxation the government says it's done what is necessary to ensure it raises money but also gets investment into the industry well fossil fuels campaign leader and ngo global witness alice harrison is with me alice harrison uh, you know if we were talking about kind of um, the cost-benefit analysis for the company, presumably he's, er he's earned it. I mean, their profits have never been higher. So we are going to have to leave it there, forgive me, from All Global right. Witness. Thank you very much for coming on to talk Thank to us you. about this. Now, Haim Topol, best known for his portrayal as the Milkman Tevi in the film version of Fiddle on the Roof, has died at the age of 87. We're a rich man. He was one of Israel's most well known actors, uh, internationally acclaimed, uh, and he played that part of the Milkman many, many times, all the way up into the end of the 1990s. Credits also include For Your Eyes Only, the James Bond movie, and Flash Gordon. And if you ever get a chance to see it and you haven't seen it, particularly that magical sequence of the wedding, Sunrise, Sunset, it's a beautiful film. You're watching BBC News. Hello, let's head to the weather in Europe this time and across France some welcome much needed more rain to come over the next few days Again, but this area of low pressure as we go through the night into Thursday the morning, going to strengthen the wind across some central come, western areas well potentially save well, 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 like BBC so news source. this is an extraordinary story speakers. of climate change you'll get the latest headlines and some of the international reactions tell us what you've been hearing in practical terms what does that mean let's just remind ourselves this is all part of the same story for your news story together with Ross Atkins just say play BBC on BBC News. World News. This is BBC News. Welcome if you're watching in the UK or around the globe. I'm Sean Lay, our top stories. Russia has launched more than 80 missiles at Ukraine. Sustained strikes hit the Kharkiv and Odessa regions, killing at least nine people and leaving much of the capital, Kyiv, without electricity. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog, R R uh, Rafael Grossi, has warned this cannot go on after the overnight strikes left the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant without power. We must commit to protect the safety and security of the plant, and we need to commit now. The British government is set to announce the construction of certain sections of the new high-speed railway HS2 will be delayed yet again to save money. Tens of thousands of people have been taking part in demonstrations uh, in Israel against proposed reforms of its judicial system. Childcare costs rise sharply in England, Scotland and Wales. A new report shows that nursery fees are almost £15,000 a year for the youngest children. And weather warnings remain in place for heavy snow in parts of the UK. The cold conditions are expected to last until the weekend. This is Rowan Bridge in Mould in North Wales, where an amber weather warning for significant ice and snow could bring disruption through today.
Right, we return now to the developing situation in Tel Aviv and Israel. Tens of thousands of Israelis are rallying, not just in that city, but across the country. It's yet another day of protest against the government's proposed overhaul of the judicial system. This is the scene in Tel Aviv, uh, a rally taking place right now in the city centre. Earlier, police removed activists trying to block the road to Ben Gurion Airport, from where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is due to leave on an official visit to Italy. And the US Secretary of Defence, Lloyd Austin, is due to arrive. Uh, the two, I think, were going to have some kind of brief meeting at the airport. Um, and uh, that was instead of Lloyd Austin coming yesterday, Wednesday, and uh, meeting the Prime Minister at the Defence Ministry. In a separate development, three Palestinian people have been shot dead by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank. Israel says the men opened fire before being shot dead by undercover officers. The Palestinian militant group Islamic Jihad says the deaths were an assassination. Well, as I say, the US Secretary of State uh, Lloyd Austin, who's the Defence Secretary's Jew in Israel, he wants to discuss the growing violence in the West Bank and what the government plans to do about it. Let's talk now to our Middle East correspondent, Yolan Nell, who is in Jerusalem. Yolan, do you think this is, in effect, simply a case of the Prime Minister underestimating the strength of feeling this reform would provoke? Yolan Nell, uh, our Jerusalem correspondent, thank you very much and for a really compelling account of a very complicated story. Thank you. Now, the British government is set to announce the confederation, uh, the consolidation of certain, se sorry, I'm going to start that again, the construction of certain sections of Britain's new high-speed rail link, known as HS2, will be postponed to save money. The delay is likely to affect sections from Manchester to Crewe and Birmingham to Crewe. The project has run billions of pounds over budget and years behind schedule. You don't need to be told that if you live in the UK. HS2, though, remains the government's flagship transport levelling up project and the largest infrastructure project in Europe. Let's talk now live to Henry Murison. He's the chief executive of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, a business-led think tank for the north of England. Mr. Murison, thank you very much for being with us. Um, thank you for Presumably me. you haven't heard anything officially. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Are you surprised by this announcement, if it does come? Okay. Henry Murison of the Northern Powerhouse Thank you very partnership. Thank you very much for being with us on BBC News. Um, it always makes puts me in mind of, of that great um, railway innovator, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who somehow through sheer stubbornness seemed to get things built, even in when the powers that be were against them. If you ever want a, a good summary of his life, try and dig out great the Bob Godfrey animation, which won an Oscar in the 1970s and has, uh, among other things, an immortal song about how if you want to get ahead, you need to get a hat. Now, forecasters are warning of heavy snow and travel disruption this morning, in particular to parts of central and northern England. The Met Office has issued an amber warning across the Peak District, Leeds, the Yorkshire Dales and the North Pennines, with many of those regions expecting between 10 and 20 centimetres of snow. The UK recorded its coldest March since 2010 last night, as temperatures plummeted to minus 16 degrees Celsius in the North Highlands. While well, our correspondent Rowan Bridge is in Mould in North Wales, waiting for the worst. Rowan Bridge. Georgia's ruling party has dropped plans to introduce a controversial law which had prompted more than two days of protests in Tbilisi, the capital. This was, was the scene on Wednesday night where demonstrators turned out for a second successive night. You can see tear gas being used and projectiles being thrown. A correspondent in Tbilisi, Rayan Dimitri, told us why the Georgian government had done an apparent U-turn. Rayan Dimitri there in Tbilisi. Now, you may have heard of the recent Japanese phenomenon known as sushi terrorism. It refers to a spate of unhygienic pranks in restaurants where people film themselves tampering with food on sushi conveyor belt. Japanese police have just made their first arrests over the videos. They've sparked outrage in a country famed for its cleanliness and where sushi on a conveyor belt is common experience. Shaima Khalil, our Tokyo correspondent, has more. Shaima Khalil not telling us whether it's altered her uh, dietary habits when she goes out for a meal. Now, Radio 2 has announced that Mae Muller will represent the, B the UK at the Eurovision Song Contest. She's performing her original track, I Wrote a Song, at the competition in Liverpool in May, hoping to emulate the success of her predecessor, Sam Ryder. Well, our Eurovision correspondent Daniel Rosney told my colleague Anita McVeigh more about the song and this year's entrant. Now, there's a new kind of lawnmower in Italy and it's 
woolly. A flock of sheep have taken over the city of Pompeii, their task with grazing to keep an archaeological site from growing vegetation, part of a sustainable agricultural initiative that helps to preserve landscape. The work of these sheep, all 150 of them, is hoped to attract more visitors and revive the ancient vineyards. And the sheep just think they're having something good to eat. Uh, more news from us at the top of the hour. Weather, of course, coming up next. Thank you very much for your company over the last few hours. You are watching World News from the BBC. Hello again. Hello. Some of Welcome us have had some heavy snow update. through the well, morning to North America, and there's first of all, more heavy snow to come the as well as ice. In fact, the Metropolis has three amber weather warnings in Fort Snag.